Hi, everyone. Welcome to the last session of our EOSC Future Open Days. I see many people are still joining, um, so we'll give them some time to join the session. In the meantime, um, I'm going to explain to you how we are collecting questions. We don't do that um, in the chat here because that gets very messy very quickly. Instead, we have a Slido page which you can join through any of these means. You can type in the very long URL if you're extremely fast, or you can go to slido.com and use the code that is shown on the screen, or just if you can want to join on your smartphone, you can scan the QR code on the screen. Then um, we'll shortly start the session on the EOSC Knowledge Hub, in which Venkats will explain to you what an EOSC Knowledge Hub is and why it's important. So Venkat, I think I'm going to hand over to you. I see many people are still joining, but then we, um, they can drop in later on. Thanks, Katrin. So good morning, everyone. So yes, uh, welcome to this uh, final session um, of the EOSC Open Days. And I thank uh, the organizers for letting me speak about uh, the Knowledge Hub, which I'll introduce shortly. Um, so just about me, um, my name is Venkat. I am the Work Package 9 leader uh, for the EOS Future project. I'm also um, primarily working for Open Air uh, as their training officer. And originally I was a biologist, but I've moved into this field of open science and uh, research data management and so forth. So yes, uh, let me introduce you to what we're doing uh, regarding this thing called the Knowledge Hub. So just a, a brief overview of um, the work packages in EOS Future. Um, I think a lot of this might have been introduced already in previous sessions, if you were able to attend those. Um, this is the overall structure. And what I'll really be talking about is, as I said, uh, work package nine, and this um, specifically is training and skills. Uh, and this is where um, a lot of the work regarding this knowledge hub is coming from. However, it's not in isolation and there is um, other work from the other work packages that um, also complement this. For example, in work package five, um, they're actually uh, going to implement what this uh, knowledge hub is going to be. Whereas what work package nine have been doing is actually providing the specifications for that. Um, there's also engagement with other work packages such as uh, 7 and 10, uh, as you can see here. So um, I want to preface what I'm going to talk about um, say, to say that this is all a work in progress. Um, so what I'm going to try and describe to you is going to be just at a very high level, um, giving you an overview of what we're doing. Um, also, I want to make, uh, make clear that um, a lot of what I'm actually going to be talking about is actually available on the public wiki and uh, the link is there. I should also state um, that these slides will be made available to everyone, so you'll be able to click on the links uh, when they are, they are actually made available. Um, so don't worry about not following exactly now. So. How does the Knowledge Hub uh, function and how does everything fit together? This is a very simple diagram um, showing you what it's all about. And essentially, the Knowledge Hub consists of two things, a training resource catalog and a learning platform. And so they're both uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, and together, they make what we call this Knowledge Hub. And this is what I will describe to you. So yes, as I said, um, the training resource catalog and um, a platform, and this will be a community resource for all things that are um, related to EOS training. 
And I want to make clear that this isn't uh, specifically about EOS future, um, but um, the wider picture here about EOSC itself. So um, we have actually um, done an, init um, an initial specification um, that's uh, already been handed in and submitted as a deliverable uh, just uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and so this will form the basis for a lot of the work that is going to be done. Through this uh, specification, we uh, identified five uh, principal actors. Uh, we call them actors here. Um, the, the communities that are being targeted, for example, uh, consumers, such as researchers, citizen scientists, and so forth, uh, providers um, who will actually provide training and the materials, et cetera. Um, they don't necessarily have to be trainers, but you know, they, anyone that's uh, providing um, or creating content. Uh, facilitators and intermediaries, uh, these could be anything like funders and so forth, um, the actual uh, research performing organizations and so forth. Of course, there are trainers themselves that are being targeted. And finally, there are project partners, uh, project in this case, meaning the EOSC future project itself, because we identified that it will be necessary to actually uh, train up a lot of the um, members of the project, because especially new members, they may not know what is going on with the project, et cetera. And we need to be able to provide that training. So in the next few slides, I'll take you through what uh, each of the things are in the training catalog and in the learning uh, platform. So to begin with, let's talk about the training catalog. So why is it actually needed? Um, well, we identified that there are too many resources out there that are scattered and disparate and it it's difficult to actually discover a lot of the material that might be required for training. Um, there are already catalogs out there that have been identified, but um, again, they are very varied and um, scattered about. And so the purpose of this EOSC uh, training catalog um, is actually to create a centralized resource. Um, sorry, I should say EOS future training catalog. Um, so users will be able to upload materials and um, I'll talk about the rules of participation later on. But of course, uh, when you're uh, creating content and you're contributing, you need to stick to the guidelines that are stated in the uh, rules of participation. Um, there is um, also a curation factored into uh, what uh, we're trying to do too. So. We do want to make sure there's uh, some quality assurance in the training materials, et cetera. Uh, this hasn't been really fully discussed, but of course, curation can be a very complex and um, time consuming effort. And so we need to um, uh, streamline that further. And of course, I'm sure everyone here is aware of the FAIR principles, and we want to make sure that we adhere to um, those principles here as well. Um, and I want to make it clear that um, what we're trying to do is reuse existing materials as much as we can. Um, there are so many materials, as I said, already out there. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, and yeah, we're trying to bring together as many of these um, scattered materials as possible into this centralized resource. Of course, there will be gaps perhaps, um, Again, a conversation that really needs to be had is how to fill in those gaps uh, where necessary. Um, of course, this could be a very time consuming effort and um, we want to minimize that as much as possible, but um, th this might be a necessity uh, depending on what might be missing. Um, we want to start off with some pilot material, and indeed we have identified a few that can be starting points. For example, such as uh, these four that are mentioned here, Yos Pillar, Tess, um, Shock, and Daria. Um, and so these resources already um, aggregate a lot of material and have produced a lot of material. And we can ask um, 
use that as a test bed for creating this uh, centralized EOS Future training catalog. So what I'll do is I'll just show you some examples of what we call user flows. So when we were uh, creating the um, uh, the specifications, and I should point out a lot of the work that I'm describing here is um, being done by many other people, uh, not just me. Um, it's been really uh, done by many other people. So. When we talk about user flows, we are um, just trying to think about practical ways that um, these training catalogs might be, this training catalog might be used. And I will also describe this for the learning platform as well. So you can actually see this on the wiki that I linked to earlier on. Um, and so this is an example of a user flow. And in this particular uh, case, we're talking about uh, metadata and the specification for that. Um, so this will be key. Metadata will be key to how the um, the resources that are going to be in the uh, catalog can be discovered and used. And so when we talk about uh, metadata here, we are talking about uh, the admins that will be able to use this to cross-reference um, the minimum metadata requirements. And I'll actually discuss uh, what this means later on uh, about the minimum metadata. Um, so when these admins actually um, specify that this metadata, there will be a system in place we envisage that will allow validation of the input. And so this, might be an automated system, which will um, look through all the fields and make sure that everything is correct um, and uh, fully uh, uh, being uh, entered into the system. And if not, then there, there will be errors that are returned. And so there will be a sort of feedback mechanism where um, the admins will be able to uh, figure this out. So another thing that we identified was um, automated aggregation. So of course, um, there, as I said, there are many resources out there already, and we want to try and make this as easy as possible to actually um, input the data, the um, training resources, et cetera. And an automated aggregation method uh, might be required. So again, this might be, um, this needs to be uh, compliant with the rules of participation. Um, and they will be uh, curated by um, an admin or admins. So again, um, this, the system that we envisage will be able to test um, a subset perhaps of these resources to validate them. Because you can imagine that there could be uh, several um, input uh, resources, but you might not be able to test all of them. Um, as well as automated um, aggregation, it might actually be necessary to uh, do manual harvesting um, or to at least allow scheduling of automated harvesting of uh, resources already out there. So a third and final um, identified uh, user flow that we wanted to highlight was the manual content creation itself. So th these might be providers that don't have a training catalog already. Uh, they might have uh, quite small collections, etc. And so they might not have the resources to create, create a training catalog. Uh, and so they can manually create metadata following, again, what we uh, discussed earlier, this minimum metadata standards. I don't want people to get too bogged down, by the way, in these user flows. Uh, I know they're quite complex and in some cases. Uh, they're just here for illustration and you can um, inspect them a lot more uh, at your leisure if you go to the wiki page, as I say. Um, so again, the, in this case, the system will be able to validate uh, new records, um, basically um, cross-referencing with a checklist and throw up any errors uh, if, if such things exist. Um, 
there will be a review process as well following uh, all these steps um, to include any of these resources into the eventual training catalog. Um, because we don't want to just uh, allow people to um, upload things randomly. Uh, we will be, as I said earlier, there will be some curation as well uh, involved in uh, the creation of this catalog. So moving on uh, to the learning platform. So what we just discussed is the uh, catalog, but now um, moving on to the learning platform, which uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the other side, uh, other half of the knowledge hub. So why is it needed? Again, it is a centralized resource. Um, and essentially this is what we would call a learning management system. Um, for example, some of you might have heard of Moodle, um, and this is, uh, we're not saying that it will definitely be Moodle, but it's definitely a, a contender for what we will actually use, um, and it will uh, form the basis of this um, uh, training platform. And so through this, you'll be able to create courses and curricula with learning outcomes and so forth. And indeed, um, we envisage that there will be some form of certification that can be gained by users at the end. Um, this could be just like a completion certificate, um, but there will be some kind of um, way to uh, let users prove that they've actually done the course, for example. Uh, curation is also a factor here, um, as before with the uh, catalog and we will try and make things as fair as possible. So again, um, just taking you through some um, identified uh, examples of user flows, uh, this time specifically for the uh, learning platform. Um, and so again, you see a, a workflow diagram here. Uh, as I said before, please don't get too bogged down in what you're seeing here, I just want to use it for illustrative purposes. So the first thing that we um, identify for the learning platform is to be able to actually publish um, some content. So when you are uh, using learning management systems such as Moodle, you want to be able to author uh, content. So this is something that we will need to factor in to be able to create interactive content and to be able to do this in a variety of formats. Uh, for example, in PowerPoints, uh, PDFs, HTML, and so forth. Um, these will, this publishing capability will be targeted at course authors or instructional designers, and um, users can uh, create this content using this um, authoring tool. But there will be limits to um, who will be able to do this due to licenses. Um, and of course, if, if that becomes the case, then we will have people that will actually act as the actual authors and anyone who has wanted to create content, they'll be um, perhaps um, kept in contact with the, the people that can actually create that content. And of course, um, there will be a review process uh, that will be done at the end when creating this content. So the second uh, identified user flow here is um, access, of course, uh, by users. So when we say users, we're talk about learners, of course, and these could be anyone really, um, whether they're researchers or um, any other uh, uh, actor that we actually identified earlier. Uh, indeed, trainers as well, because we want to talk about um, multipliers and uh, train the trainers here, um, they could definitely be one of these actors. Um, so the learners will be guided through a course from um, an introduction to it, uh, through the actual lessons, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to per perhaps do tests and actually get a completion certificate um, that they've actually done this course. Um, 
this may require um, a user to actually log in. And I can't remember if this was actually mentioned in previous um, presentations during the open days, but there will be AAI systems in place um, where people will log in. Uh, this will be seamless with other systems. Uh, you'll probably be using the same um, uh, login uh, cred credentials that you will use for other services. Uh, but of course, if, by logging in, then you'll be able to track progress. Uh, you will be able to um, get these certificates, for example. And so that, that might become a requirement here. Lastly, for uh, this, uh, these user flows, um, we also identified access to a trainer's uh, directory. So, there are going to be several trainers out there from different communities and different uh, projects that already exist. Um, we want to, again, form a centralized resource where um, these trainers can actually be identified and contacted by learners. Um, so this will be targeted at registered users and admins uh, specifically but there will be access to non-registered users as well. Um, so for example, if you're registered um, or an admin, you'll be able to uh, find out the info about um, trainers, like their personal data, background, expertise, and so forth. Non-registered users, meanwhile, um, will be able to access some of this information, but they may not be able to see um, the uh, personal data, for example, of these trainers. But these are uh, considerations that we're trying to uh, look into. And um, definitely the trainers directory is a, a very important component of uh, the learning platform. So the rules of participation and minimal metadata that has been mentioned a few times already. So firstly, the rules of participation um, so now we're talking about the training resources specifically. You will probably have heard about the rules of participation already, but um, from the uh, point of view of EOSC itself, and indeed there is um, already uh, that in place, um, and this link actually takes you to that. Um, but there are no special provisions perhaps that are necessary for training providers specifically. So what we're talking about here with the rules of participation is heavily based on what already exists uh, for EOSC, um, as I say, which you can see here. Um, so we want to regard training as a service, just like anything else that is available through EOSC, whether uh, that's storage or compute uh, services, et cetera. Training is being regarded just as um, in the same manner uh, a service like those. Um, so the resources need to meet uh, a minimum, uh, well, I'm asking here, do they need to meet a minimum set of requirements? Um, and so that is actually described in this metadata standards, which is here. And um, what we're using here um, is actually based on work that's al already been done by um, this RDA, the Research Data Alliance uh, Education and Training um, Group, uh, interest group. And they have actually done a lot of work already. And there's a link here that I, I provided to the RDA page, uh, which you'll be able to um, uh, access later on. Um, so what they've done is actually identified a minimum set of um, metadata for these training materials. And indeed, there are 14 uh, fields that have been identified, which you can see here. Um, and these will form the basis for uh, what we're trying to do through the learning platform and the training catalog. Um, so I think I, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, when, for example, you might be automatically automated uh, upload of uh, training resources, they will need to be validated. They will be cross-referenced to a checklist of um, metadata fields. And 
this you could imagine that these are some of the fields or all the fields sorry that um need to be checked against but this is just the minimum set of course we want to make sure that um, the metadata is as rich and full as possible so there could be several other fields on top of this that that need to be filled out as well but for um to pass the test, then uh, you could imagine that these are some of the, uh, the core components that need to be um, validated. Um, so we need to um, implement this, and this is uh, going to be ongoing work. So finally, um, the release plan for what we're talking about here. and. Um, we hope that the catalog will have a first beta version um, by month 14 of the EOS Future project. So that's roughly um, middle of next year. And soon after that, we hope to have like uh, a second beta version of that as well uh, by month 16 and a full production uh, version released by month 18. Um, on the other hand, for the learning platform, um, similar time scales but slightly off uh, from the catalog we hope to have a first beta version by month 16 and then a second one by uh, month 18 and a production release by month 20 um, with subsequent updates perhaps as well um, each of these versions will have uh, various functionalities released um, and it'll be done in a staggered fashion. Um, and by the time that the full production releases um, out there, we hope uh, all the functionalities out there. But of course, this is, um, as I said, a work in progress. And it's something that we encourage people to get in touch with us about, about what they actually might want to see in these um, resources. Um, we're not saying that uh, what we have um, discussed internally is like the, the final um, be all and end all. Um, if there is anything that um, is a glaring omission, for example, we welcome um, contributions from the community. And of course, this is for the community. And so uh, we wish to actually make sure that uh, everything is um, correct for them. So that's all i've actually got to present right now and thank you for your attention and um there's going to be time now i think for a few questions and uh these are some contact details for you as well so do please get in touch with me or there's uh, another email address here training at yieldsfuture.eu which um will also go to me and various others in the project uh i did mention also that um i'm talking from <clears throat> A work package nine, the training and skills uh, work package perspective, but there's uh, work being conducted in other work packages as well. But we can uh, try and uh, get you in touch with other work packages if, if required. But uh, thank you for your time, and I welcome questions now. And if you stop sharing your screen, then I'll show the questions that have already been asked. There's quite a few. No, oh, okay. So there's uh, a comment uh, by Ellen who actually um, leads on this for for shock. Um, I, actually, Ellen, do you want to make a comment if you want to unmute? Hi. Yeah. Sorry, I was looking for the unmute button. Of course. Um, yeah. So the shock project is looking at a couple of of, of options because. Um, um, and we're currently doing an update so that actually um, aligning better with the RDA recommended minimum metadata is, is done, but also that we make it possible for other, let's say, uh, for example, a, a catalog of catalogs in the US future could harvest uh, easily the, um, the shock training discovery toolkit. So, it, it, we don't know yet uh, where the maintenance uh, will be of uh, the future um, training discovery toolkit. It could be a group of partners from the shock project that picked this up. It could be uh, uh, in other uh, one of the 
one of the partners that picks it up and uh, but the, the the main thing is that it will uh, be kept updated later on and because otherwise its use is it, it's it's useless <laughs> to say um and um if the maintenance and curation is uh, is done then it's uh, the main goal is to make it to make sure that it can be uh, used by other catalogs such as the one of use future yeah okay can i add to this so. alan uh, mm -hmm. i i raised my hand but i don't know if you see that yes thank you yes please go ahead yeah i i i uh, um, had the same question as ellen and she's uh, running this so she uh, her answer is uh, something to uh, keep in mind but i was a bit uh, worried by what you said about yeah uh, things may overlap and uh, uh, we will um, take care of this i mean i think that the model of catalog of catalogs is much more interesting than um uh, one that has uh, this centralistic approach that I sense in your answer, maybe you didn't mean it that way. It would be good to have that a bit more clear because as we've seen in, in other discussions, the, the federated model, including the system of system or the cloud of clouds or et cetera, is, is, is I think a very clear concept that would help us all to uh, move forward. And um, yeah. Uh Mm -hmm. I, I see what you mean, and I apologize if I, if, yeah, because ultimately what um, the Knowledge Hub will do is actually point users in the direction of what is out there. Um, I'm just thinking about sustainability in the sense uh, how long things like the shock uh, resources or any other resources might any, actually Any exist. resources uh, um, yeah. is, is not forever uh, unless yeah. there yeah. is permanent funding. We all know this, yeah. but uh, in the case of Shock, and I think the same is true for the other cluster platforms, um, there is now an MOU underway, so there are in, at least intentions and the, uh, to, to have this as a sustainable initiative. And uh, on top of that, there are all kinds of attempts to make sure that cluster level uh, initiatives and, and resources um, will be able to apply for uh, for at least coordination funding. Uh, so we are all looking for sustainability of the models that we have in place. Nothing is guaranteed, I agree, but it's not something that has been neglected by the cluster. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean, mean to uh, say otherwise, yeah. Um, because of course, uh, just as any other service, we, we're, it is a federated model and we, we're trying to point people in, in the direction of whatever exists there. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. And there's another other question that we have um, that also got an upvote, which is, is the catalog for materials for training events or self-learning materials or both? Um, yeah, events will be part of that as well. Uh, Self-learning materials, um, well, for example, with the learning platform and what is envis envisaged to be uh, created in terms of content, uh, curricula and um, learning paths or learning outcomes and so forth. Um, these are all going to be part of um, the, the the whole knowledge hub not perhaps specifically the catalog itself but um the knowledge hub um as as a greater entity okay i think yeah yeah i hope that's clear if not then by all means do ask a follow-up question um here as well then um another question is uh hmm. so anyone whether anyone can suggest content for the learning platform courses um, and that then it has to be approved by EOSC or by EOSC Future. So maybe you can um, tell us a bit more about the approval process or sort of the decision-making process and which content would go up there. Um, yeah, I don't know is <laughs> the answer really. Uh, that, that is an, uh, a conversation that really is uh, yet to be had, I think. Um, as I said earlier, there is going to be curation. Um, I'm wary of how much curation we need to do because that is a major undertaking. Um, 
but certainly it is something that that needs to be done um because yes we envisage that anyone could actually provide content um if there are suggestions on on this then um we would be um, i'd be very well willing to hear about this um but yes we, it, it is going to be open to anyone really okay yeah i think it's, it's early days and that these are sort of the things that we're still trying to figure out right yeah 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 um then i think as a follow-up question to the the shop catalog i was mentioned before someone asked whether there's more a general strategy for avoiding duplication and for including already existing training materials i don't know whether that was covered by your answer to the shop catalog or whether there's something that you would like to add there um maybe person can um clarify what they mean in the the slider as well don't know that cat Sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to see which question. So it's uh, this about. one here about the general strategy for already existing training materials. I think that's a follow up question from the discussion about the shock catalog. Okay. Um, well, yeah, there is going to a lot of the materials that already exist and and these disparate catalogs, they, they might have overlapping subject matter. And that's something that can't really be avoided. Um, as I think was just clarified now, um, the EOS Future Training Catalog um, is going to act as a central hub perhaps, but it is essentially going to also um, point people in the right direction of what might already be there. So yes, there will be duplicate um, content, if you want to put it like that. But um, I, I guess that is up to the user to figure this out. And of course, a lot of this content might actually be similar superficially, but they might be focused on specific uh, research domains and yeah, other factors that might not be entirely evident if you were just to look at it from um, in a superficial way. So yes, there are similar workflows, for example, uh, RDM workflows that you might see in one field of research compared to another, um, but there might be specifics in terms of metadata um, that you need to be wary of depending on the field of research. And so, yes, uh, there could be duplication in, in a loose sense um, of these materials. Yeah, I, I think it's questions that came back throughout the past three days about how will we work together with others I think we're very aware that we're not operating in a vacuum and that there's a lot of materials out there already whether that's other platforms doing similar things to what we are doing or catalogs with resources that we need to include and the same goes for training so we're we're aware of this I think but I think yeah. when asking this question also knows that fully integrating that is always a big challenge so there might be some duplication I think um then because you mentioned metadata, there's someone who asks about metadata for training materials um, and whether we would use um, a controlled vocabulary and there's existing yes. standards there. Yeah, that's yeah. also a debate yeah. that, we, that keeps coming back, I think. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, when we're talking about metadata, we, we want to try and use controlled vocabularies as much as possible. Uh, so those 14 different fields that I um showed earlier um that were um identified by the rda work, um, interest group um yes a lot of them will have control of vocabularies but of course like many of those fields will also have free text um for example like um a field that just asks for a description of of what these materials are um we could certainly look into uh creating a list of perhaps keywords that could be used by um, content providers that can at least you know stick to some kind of controlled vocabulary but um, where possible there will be yes but we can't say that uh, for all the fields that there will be um, this possibility i think maybe if that's if does it answer the question for the 
the person who asked this question, um, because maybe there's something that you would like to share on this or follow up on as well. Um, if you want to unmute yourself, um, please raise your hand in the chat and then we can follow up on this if you want to. Maybe they want to stay completely anonymous, which is also fine. Um, I think then that we've we've gone through all the questions. Um, I don't know whether there's um, a final takeaway message that you would want to give Fencat. If not, we'll we'll start wrapping up because I know that you need to, you have another event to attend yeah. shortly. Yeah. Well, no, I, just uh, do get in touch. Um, this is for the community. Um, we are open to uh, discussion and uh, contributions. And of course, we're looking for content as well. Um, we've identified a few that can be used as pilots, um, but I'm sure there are lots of others that can be um, added as well. Sorry, I think that another question just came up. Oh, um, how would you describe the level of complexity um, or difficulty of these tools for researchers or for beginners? Um, don't know what uh, that's a question that is necessarily training, but I, I would like to hear your answer to it. Sort of how difficult are these things to use? I'm I'm trying to interpret the question. Uh, so um, I, the, the, I'm, there's tool, a lot of interpretation tools. on my part here as well, but I think what they're asking is not about training tools, but about tools that might be provided or resources provided through EOSC and, yeah, and whether so, they are difficult to so, use. Yeah, so what, one of the identified things um, that we, we noted in the user flows uh, is, and also I think one of the fields in the metadata is uh, what level that the, the, the materials are going to be ta targeted at, whether it's advanced, uh, intermediate or beginner level. Uh, that's one of the things that need to be annotated to the um, the training resources. So, of course, there's going to be a mixture of um, content in, in the catalog, um, whether it is for beginners, um, et cetera. And, of course, um, different research domains, different types of actors, as I identified, <clears throat> excuse me, um, at the beginning, we identified five different actors, uh, whether they're consumers, intermediaries, trainers, uh, and so forth. Um, so these will all be different metadata um, fields that need to be uh, filled out as well. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, because I remember that this discussions, oh, we have a, a raised hand there. I'll unmute you. Okay, hi. So I, I, I just wanted to come back to the question that I put in the question about metadata before. And uh, um, the thing is that, like, uh, the reason why I ask this is because it would be nice to have certain guidelines that you can give to the people who are actually developing resources. So we okay. are uh, uh, like our self-developing resources or like together with other uh, like global bioimaging, we're developing certain resources for training and uh, we would want them to be discoverable, right? So if you give us these guidelines on what kind of, uh, if there are certain keywords, certain metadata that we can employ while we are already asking our uh, trainers to actually formulate the modules, then it would be, I mean, it will be fantastic for us, but it will be incredibly useful for you because <laughs> then the things will be pretty easily discoverable. So I was wondering if there's any going to be any effort or if there are any, because I, I wasn't aware if there, there are any existing efforts in this direction. Actually, there's a task force looking at making um, trading materials fair. Um, which I'm also part of, and that sort of feeds into what you're saying. Um, if you want, uh, please do get in touch with me offline and we can discuss this. And um, actually, that is something that absolutely you're right. Uh, we want to be able to um, provide, uh, give the providers um, guidance on uh, how they should uh, do this from the outset um retrospectively um trying to make things uh, discoverable is going to be a lot more uh, difficult than doing it from the um the start absolutely i i agree um and so this is something that um we're actually looking at in, in this task force as i mentioned 
Uh, and yes, I agree that uh, this is something that should be done through the Knowledge Hub as well. Any other questions? I, I didn't see any um, come in through the chat. So um, unless you see, I see a thumbs up there. So I, I think that was a good answer, Venkat. Um, if there's anyone else that has a question, you can raise your hand here or you can post them to Slido. If not, we'll wrap up. Um, I maybe wanted to come back to that question on the level of sort of the level that we're targeting at, because I remember from discussions about training materials that that one of the key points that we said there is we can't just make training materials for people that already know a lot. Then there needs to be a, a way for people who are not yet at an advanced level to get started and then for them to move through the training. So it's something that we're very aware of. And um, I think I myself am very aware of because I'm fairly new to EOSC and it is a steep learning curve sometimes, I think. Um, so it, it is something that we are taking into account. Um, then no extra questions have popped up. So um, I think, thank you all very much for joining. Um, it's been an interesting three days. Um, so for us now, it's a wrap. We're, I think, done. Um, there's a few things that I would still want to say, which is most of all, here's a way of staying in touch with us. So um, you can follow us online, on Twitter, on um, LinkedIn, and you can also follow our website. You can also, if you want to rewatch these um, meetings, you can do so at the EOSC portal YouTube. So we don't have our own YouTube channel, we're using the one from EOSC portal, but all the recordings from all the sessions are already there or will be there by this afternoon. So thank you very much for joining and I'm hoping to see you at uh, future events that we're organizing.